What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we're talking about artificial sweeteners. We have a new human randomized control trial looking at the effects of non-nutritive sweeteners versus water on weight loss over a year period of time. In this study, which was done in the UK, they recruited about 500 people, they had quite a few dropouts, but they still had several hundred data points by the end of 52 weeks, which is really impressive for a randomized control trial. So they randomized these folks into two different groups. First group was told you have to have at least two diet beverages per day. The other group said you have to have at least two glasses of cold water per day, but each group could have as much water as they wanted. The water group was instructed to avoid non-nutritive sweetened beverages. Both groups were told they could have sugar sweetened beverages, so like regular soda, but each group got the same dietary counseling on things to avoid, how to have a successful diet. They got quite a bit of support. Now this study is important because I've talked about a few studies like kind of comparing, you know, non-nutritive sweeteners to water because a lot of people when these studies come out, that show positive effects of non-nutritive sweeteners, people go, well, it's not better than water. Kind of like this sanctimonious, I am doing it naturally and you aren't, blah, 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 blah. So this study looked at them head to head for weight loss. And what they found was at the end of the study, on average, the group consuming the diet, we'll just say diet drinks, lost a kilo and a half more weight than the group consuming water. They also looked at several other things, including waist circumference, hip circumference, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, triacylglycerides, total cholesterol to triglyceride ratio, HbA1c, fasting plasma glucose, fasting serum insulin, AST, which is a liver enzyme, ALT, GGT, hunger, sugar consumption, sweetener consumption, activity level, and they looked at fat mass, fat-free mass, android fat percentage distribution, and gynoid fat percentage distribution. So the weight was statistically significant. Hip circumference was statistically significantly different between groups at the end. Most of these other things weren't. There was a statistical difference in HDL improvement with the non-nutritive sweetener group having a little bit better improvement in HDL than the water group. As far as everything else, there was only one other difference between the groups, which was uh, sweetener consumption, which is obvious because the group consuming the non-nutritive sweeteners is gonna have a greater level of sweetener consumption than the group consuming water. So that's a, a, a no duh one. There were a couple interesting like time differences. So you have to understand, you can compare baseline to end of study for you know, water and for non-nutritive sweeteners. And then you compare between groups at the end of study in terms of the change. There were some things such as like HbA1c improved from baseline to the end in the water group, but not the non-nutritive sweetener group. But at the end, there was no differences between groups. This may seem confusing, but it basically just boils down to how statistics work. We kind of look at the between group differences as the gold standard, does it actually matter? There was one interesting point I wanted to bring up, which it wasn't statistically different between groups because of the variance, but the group getting the non-nutritive sweeteners increased their step count on average by about 800 steps per day. Is that enough to explain the differences in weight loss, especially when it's not statistically significant? I'm not sure, I kind of don't think so. Non-nutritive sweeteners are not fat burners. They're not increasing fat loss, so what is happening? Well, what's happening is people who are consuming non-nutritive sweetened beverages are probably just consuming less calories throughout the day because they're getting that sweet taste from that, so perhaps they don't feel the need to pursue it elsewhere. We do see this, there's other studies that have shown this, that people, when water or non-nutritive sweetened beverages are compared head to head, at best, there's no difference, and at worst, in terms of water, there is a significant difference favoring the diet beverages. I am not saying you need to drink diet beverages, but I am saying that they appear to be a useful weight loss tool. And not only did people lose more weight in the diet beverage group, they actually regained less when they followed up with people who were using them. So I think that's important because those are useful tools. And people make this big deal about, well, if you're getting the sweet taste, you're gonna keep pursuing it and consume more food and more sweetness and have more insulin and more insulin resistance. Uh, where? 52 weeks, hundreds of subjects, didn't show any difference. 
they improved whether they had water or non nutritive sweetener. So if you want to do water, it's fine. Like you will lose just as much fat if you're eating the same amount of calories. But if you want to use diet drinks or diet sodas to help control your hunger, it appears to be a perfectly reasonable tool. I want to call something out right now because I know people are going to ask about it and it's going to be a big deal. This study was funded by the American Beverage Association. I'm sure all the anti-artificial sweetener people out there are just like, see, see, it bought and paid for. Uh, a few important caveats. So if your only criticism of a study is the funding source, it actually says more about your bias than the researchers. This was a well-designed, well-executed study. They were looking at so many measurements over such a long period of time, they actually had to pay people. They paid people to finish the study, I think 300 British pounds. And if they did a DEXA, they paid them like an extra 200 pounds. And if they did some of these other measures, they paid them like, I think 100, 150 extra pounds. So somebody could have made like up to like 600, 650 pounds. That's close to like eight, $900 uh, US. I'm not sure the exact exchange rate right now. So when you're talking about hundreds of people, they would have spent probably well over $100,000 just on paying the subjects. That's very impressive. You're not going to get that typically out of a government funded study. It, researchers, we have this weird thing where we like have to live, you know? Like we have to eat food and stuff. And so you got to pay the researchers. And so that costs money. And their equipment costs money weirdly. And the subjects cost money weirdly. And all the analysis costs money. So somebody's got to fund it. So who's going to fund it? Companies that want to know what this research says, like the American Beverage Association. So what's important is that in the contract, and it states this in the funding disclosure, the authors retained the right to publish the data no matter what the data was. That's really important. Some of these funding studies, the authors don't retain that right. So if it comes out that there's a, a negative effect, uh, and then the company that funds it doesn't want it published, it won't be published. So that's one thing. Additionally, the American Beverage Association was not involved in the planning, design, or execution of the study. And the execution, data collection, and data analysis was analyzed and observed by a third party, an independent third party, to assure appropriate controls and veracity of the data. So again, if you wanna say, well, it's funded by this, so I'm not gonna pay attention, fine, but this study was more well-controlled than most studies that are independently funded. So I feel pretty confident in this data, and it fits with the other data we have on this topic. Guys, if you wanna learn how to break down this research and understand it better, that's why I created REPS, my monthly research review. Each month we break down five studies in fitness that are popular, maybe having a bunch of claims thrown around about them. You know, PTs and your everyday folks, so many people ask me, hey, what does this study mean? This is your chance to spend 13 bucks a month and get all the answers you want because we break them down in a way that's palatable and easy for anyone to understand and we give you practical takeaways about what it means for you, your training, and your nutrition. Click the link in the description, sign up. I'll catch you guys next week.